On the screen is a spreadsheet where I've programmed a calculation for the margin of error. Now, what is the margin of error? It's essentially a measurement of the amount of error introduced when you survey a sample of a population instead of surveying the entire population. Now, the reason people use samples is that when you're trying to get, a, say, an opinion on a certain issue from an entire population, it would be incredibly expensive, time consuming, and virtually impossible to get everybody to answer if you send that survey out to every single individual. So as an example in this calculation, suppose the population size is 1,500. So we've got 1,500 as the size of the population. And in here I've said, okay, let's suppose I'm going to select 100 people from that population to ask them about this issue. Now this does assume that everybody's going to answer, so this means really 100 responses out of 1,500 of the population. You'll see a number right here, 95%. So there's something called a confidence level. And virtually every application, statisticians pick a level of confidence of 95%. In some certain circumstances, such as dealing with uh, analysis of medical trials, people will often use 99%. But for the rest of us and in general business, you can just set this to be 95%. So what does this tell us? At a 95% confidence level, if we were to sample 100 people out of a population of 1,500, our margin of error is 9.5%. Now, what does that mean? It means if you ask the population a question, and of course your sample answers the question, if it comes back and says, you know, 25% of people are in favor of doing X, depending on what that X represents. So whether it's the installation of a casino in the neighborhood or whatever issue might be on the table. If we do that, then really we could only say for the population, so for everybody, that the population is really only in favor of that somewhere between 25% minus 9.5% up to 25% plus 9.5%. So we've really got this 19% window, so this 19% range in the middle, where we say we are 95% certain that the population answer is in that window. We can't say that it's the exact 25%. So let me give you one more example. So if you're familiar with HR, HR runs a engagement survey into the employee workforce and you know, say we're gonna sample our employee workforce, and it comes back that in 2020, let me just expand this so you can see it. So in 2020, 82% was the employee base overall engagement score. And in 2021, the overall workforce responded sort of 91% positive. An HR leader, can't necessarily go back to the leadership and say, oh, our engagement score is up 9% because you sampled the workforce. And let's suppose that the margin of error for the survey that you ran was plus or minus 5%. Then that means that had you surveyed and received a response from every single person, that really the population's opinion is somewhere between 86% and 96%. So how do we get those numbers? So it was a score of 91, but it's plus or minus 5%. So 91 minus 5% means it could be as low as 86% for the population, up to 91 plus 5%, 96%. So if we received a response from every single person, our sample size really just reflects onto the population that the population's opinion is anywhere between 86% and 96%. Now let's look at the score for 2020. So 2020 was 82%. So here's our 82% in the middle. It's really, if we project that onto the population from our sample, anywhere between 77% and 87%, so plus or minus 5% on each side. Now you'll notice that this range, 77 to 87, and 86 to 96, it overlaps in the middle. 
And because it overlaps in the middle, we cannot conclude that the engagement score for 2021 is higher than the score for 2020. While it looks like it went up 9% just by looking at the scores, if you actually did this with a sample, you cannot conclude that those numbers increased. Now, there's probably a good chance that there did, but because 2020 for the population could be as high as 87, and the number for the population could be as low as 86, if 2020 was here and 2021 was here, it actually went down. So the only time that you can conclude that the numbers did actually go up is if these ranges do not overlap each other at all. Let's take a look at this image on the right. So this will demonstrate for you what the impact of sample size is on the margin of error. So suppose a sample size of 96 yielded a margin of error of 10%. So this tells us that for all the responses on our survey, we really have a range of plus or minus 10% on every single response that we have. As we increase the sample size, so 384, 600, 1067, 2401, and these specific numbers don't matter, but these essentially, the larger the sample size, you can see the tighter the range becomes. So the margin of error goes down and you can start to pin your response to a tighter and tighter range. So let's take a look at the numbers I have over here. So if I receive 100 responses out of a population of 1,500, my calculation says I have a margin of error of 9.5%. Now, since that's going to be plus or minus 9.5%, my range, like this, my range spans 19%. That might be too much for me to live with in my survey results. Maybe I want to pin it down tighter. So, of course, we can start to increase this sample size to get our margin of error lower and lower. And you have to make that business decision of, okay, how many responses do we need to receive in order to get a margin of error that we can live with? So if I received 400 responses, I can now say that my survey results are good within plus or minus 4.2%. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to press like and subscribe. Click the notification bell to receive a message when new videos are released. You can also explore the other videos in this series or visit our website for more information on how to use data analysis to improve your business.